Uh, importantly, we can also use genetic engineering techniques to introduce the same mutations found in humans into model animal systems such as mouse, and we talk, talked a lot about this today at the meeting. Um, this has been done now for many of the autism risk genes such as Shank1, the Norexin1 gene mentioned in the Globe and Mail article, and CNVs discussed earlier. Using some ingenious testing techniques, the social and behavior attrib attributes observed in humans having autism can now be measured in these mouse models and in control mice. As shown here, all five human genes studied in mice exhibit some or all of the impairments observed in humans uh, with autism. This type of experiment provides even further proof of a role of these genes in autism. Importantly, these animal models can also be used for studying the biology of autism and for testing new medicines for their effects. Now, a major finding of the genetic studies has been that many of the autism genes identified encode proteins that are involved in development, regulation, and maintenance of the neuronal synapses that are absolutely critical to brain function. Shown here is a cartoon of the synapse, which is the space between two adjacent brain cells or neurons. The adjacent neurons are connected by the norexin structural proteins called beta-norexin and neuroligin. These genes shown in red in this figure are all known autism susceptibility genes. In my opinion, this is perhaps one of the most important discoveries in the history of autism research since it provides rational starting targets to develop effective medicines for autism. In the past, the medicine development has been really targeted at a black box. So this discovery of mapping specific genes and proteins to the synapse provides uh, insight into how we should move forward in designing rational therapies to treat this disorder. This striking image shows the dendrites or the branches from a neurotypical control individual on the left compared to the dendrites from a male individual carrying only a single functional shank 2 gene uh, instead of the two copies uh, of the same gene that the vast majority of the population has. Shank 2 is very similar in gene structure and function to the shank one gene I showed in the four generation family earlier. We believe that this is in fact the key, in the, this is the cause of autism in this individual. It, is the, it acts via the reduced synaptic spine volume due to one copy of the shank one gene missing that <clears throat> is the underlying structural problem of the brain leading to autism. Following the previous metaphor, the resulting synapses would be like a tree with very few branches, twigs, or perhaps leaves. This has become a reoccurring observation with the genes being found to be involved in autism. Very importantly, very importantly, very, very importantly, uh, in this case, the genetic results found in the Shank 2 gene provided the necessary scientific evidence to free the French mother whose son carried this mutation. The mother was actually blamed for causing the autism in her child by raising him improperly. And it was really the identification of this mutation and later the functional definition shown in this slide that was used to um, free her from the mandatory psychotherapy sessions imposed upon her by local authorities. So this is an excellent example of the genetic science revealing the truth of helping families, dispelling the myth of the refrigerator mother. And this was just in the last decade, I should say. I mean, it might be expected that there would also be altered homeostasis or equilibrium at the synapse and other disorders that have autistic characteristics, such as fragile X that I mentioned earlier, Angelman syndrome, and Rett syndrome. And in fact, this turns out to be the case. The altered homeostasis is depicted by the floating or sinking ball um, shown in the test tube in each of these images. Figure A shows a typical neuron where the proteins are in balance, so the ball is at mid-level density. Figure B shows a situation in fragile X syndrome where there are normal dendrites but decreased density and abnormally shaped dendritic spines. Figure C shows the case for Angelman syndrome where there are normal dendritic uh, dendrites on the neurons but decreased density of and abnormally shaped dendritic spines. And finally, figure D and E show a similar effect of altered homeostasis and Rett syndrome were deletions, so only one copy present, or duplications, three copies of the MECP2 gene that is involved in Rett syndrome lead to too, many, too few or too many dendritic spines. <clears throat> Similar observations in other autism genes that have been identified put forth the hypothesis that perhaps most or all of autism is in some way or another linked to synapse development and function. In other words, different trees with different branches in the forest. 
So what now? As I've shown through scientific investigation, we've started to crack the autism enigma, the enigma, but how can we use the new DNA and imaging tools, for example, to help families and doctors? In my personal opinion, it will be necessary to use these technologies combined with traditional behavioral and physical examinations to identify which of the children uh, on the right will need to be followed closer than others for potentially developing autism. Standard examination may identify the child on the far right crawling uh, on his own as the one behaving in an autistic uh, manner. However, DNA testing might alert doctors that the boy in the line at the right is the one who's behaving in an autistic way based on how he lines up objects, perhaps in this case other children. Uh, I think it's really a, a perception. Ultimately, such genetic-based diagnoses will need to be confirmed by clinical examination. So given that autism seems to be a collection of rare conditions that are clinically grouped together, the idea is to use genetic markers or other biomarkers to divide individuals into subgroups. For example, the blue group may have the fragile X form of autism and treatment A may work for them. The green group may have the chromosome 16P uh, deletion, copy number variant form of autism, and treatment B may be effective for them. Other groups may respond in different ways to uh, different inter interventions, both positively or negatively, which is equally important, um, based on the DNA uh, profile that they have. In instances where <clears throat> there are lineups of individuals awaiting for a diagnosis, the genome testing could be used, perhaps, to help prioritize those 20% or so of individuals for which we know the genetic architecture, uh, and we can actually test to see if they're at risk to being on the spectrum. In some cases, such as, uh, as when there's a family history, some genetic tests could be used in actually a predictive manner also. This article on the left uh, was from the Toronto Star in 2008, and it's an example where a CNV discovery using the clinical microarrays I talked about was used to help confirm a diagnosis of aut autism. In many cases, families can experience a so-called diagnostic odyssey where they visit many different specialists attempting to get a definitive diagnosis with respect to autism, but perhaps also with respect to other health conditions they may have, like seizures or anxiety. <clears throat> with the new genomic technologies, testing from blood or saliva samples can be completed in a very short period of time, perhaps shorter than it takes to perform in a clinical examination. In the province of Ontario, over 1,000 clinical microarrays genetic tests were run last year for autism, returning in a roughly 15% of cases an explanation to that family why the autism came about in their situation. Uh, in the example in this article, the boy was found to carry the chromosome 16P deletion, which by all indications is the cause of his autism, as far as we can tell. And as far as we can tell, this CNV arose as a random event, which has solved the puzzle of the boy's autism, soothing the family that they didn't do something wrong in bringing him up. And now our Canadian team is working as part of an international consortium to actually sequence the genomes of well over um, four or 5,000 families from around the world that have autism to find the remaining 80% of undiscovered genetic determinants that we think are involved. And presented here are some of our preliminary data from this project. Here, using whole genome sequencing, the highest resolution genetic scan possible, we identify two genetic variants that we believe contribute to autism in this family. The male index case on the bottom left is shown with the black arrow and the black, uh, black box. He inherits a mutation from his father who has Asperger's syndrome. And this mutation involves the KCNQ2 potassium channel gene. This gene is known to cause a form of neonatal epilepsy that both dad and son have, as would be predicted based on their genetic results. The gene has also been suspected to be involved in autism. The boy inherits a different mutation from his mother, and this one affects the AFF2 gene. AFF2 is very similar to the fragile X gene I mentioned earlier, which we know is involved in autism. So we believe that this mutation is in fact the primary factor causing autism in the boy. In the case of the AFF2 mutation carried by the mother, because it's an inherited variant, does not have an effect because she's a female. She has a second X chromosome that likely protects her. You may also notice that the boy's uh, sibling sister on the right carries both of these mutations. So far, she has not experienced epilepsy or autism, again, probably because she's a girl having a protective X chromosome. 
But as this girl gets older, she will need to be counseled that her family, uh, her children may be at increased risk for autism. Perhaps the most exciting finding that has come about that there are new drugs being developed that target the molecular pathways involved in this specific fragile X form of autism. And in the future, these drugs may help this specific family and others. I won't have time to talk about it tonight, but our whole genome sequencing experiments are generating similar results and exciting data for many, many families and forming probably uh, hundreds of families on potential outcomes and ways in which they may actually uh, benefit from using this genetic information. <clears throat> I will only briefly show this slide because Dr. Anna Ganastu would talk about it in the panel discussion. But here are a few examples of novel drugs being developed based on the genetic research studies of autism. The family discussed on the previous slide carrying the AFF2 genetic alteration may be an ideal one based on their genetic profile for using the STX novel um, drugs mentioned on this slide. And this is the case because these drugs have been developed to tar target the fragile X form of autism, which in fact we think this family has. To the contrary, other families with different mutations and different genes have other forms of autism and therefore may not benefit from this class of drugs. Using this type of individualized medicine, the likelihood of developing effective drugs for autism treatment and giving them the right to the right people who will react in the right way should only get much better over time. One of the biggest challenges in deciphering the complexities of autism is the fact that it is a disorder of the brain. Not too many living people that I know want to give up their brain for research. That's a joke. <clears throat> I keep asking my students, but they, they keep saying no to me, so. <laughs> Again, coming to the rescue is scientific technology. A new technology called induced pluripotent stem cells, or IPS, has been developed that allows skin cells to be taken and amazingly turned into any type of cell in the body. This technology uh, is deemed so important, it was actually awarded the Nobel Prize for medicine last year. Here, Joel Ross and James Ellis, uh, my colleagues at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, working with our clinical genetics group led by Wendy Roberts and Melissa Carter, took skin cells from a boy uh, with autism who has the PTCHD1 deletion I mentioned on my slide a little bit earlier. This is one of the six genes that's most prevalent in the Canadian population. With the addition, <clears throat> with the addition of a few, uh, as four, a few as four growth factors, the so-called Yamanaka factors, named after the Japanese scientists who developed this process, the skin cells can be reprogrammed into full-fledged functional neurons shown on the right image. And you can't really see it, but there's some staining of particular markers that indicate that these actually, these cells have been transformed into functional neurons. So these so-called personalized neurons can then be used in electrophysiological testing, chemical testing, and to examine the effects of new medicines in a system that mimics the human brain. Collections of these types of neurons are being generated around the world, and we talked about it today at this meeting, and together these resources will facilitate new research studies driving forth the understanding of the brain. There has been significant scientific progress in that we are beginning to crack, uh, make a crack in the enigma that we call autism. Much has been accomplished, but as in any enigma, answers can also lead to many new questions. I've listed just a few of the big questions that I think about most and that our laboratory will be pursuing in the next few years. There are many others, and I am sure some of these will be come up, come up in the panel discussion. So on my list is, uh, why are there so many genes involved in autism? Are all of the ASD risk genes and proteins somehow involved in regulating and maintaining the neuronal synapse during development and plasticity? So perhaps we can come up with a, a unifying model by following this hypothesis. How do we marry advances in genetics and imaging with neuropsychological theory, all to advance opportunities for individuals with autism?